In relation to the first topic, our next discussion will focus on the initiative of the Philippines to rescue the Jewish refugees, entitled Drawing Inspiration from the Initiatives of Former President Manuel L. Quezon in Helping Holocaust Victims. This will be discussed by our next speaker, who is an assistant professorial lecturer of history at the De La Salle University. He is the most active public historian on Philippine television and one of the most visible history speakers in social media and cyberspace in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Several times, he spoke for the Department of Education and was speaker of the Embassy of Israel in the Philippines in the Histocon 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next discussion, Professor Michael Charleston Shao B. Chua. Makasaysayang araw po sa ating lahat. Historic day to everyone. Uh, I would like to acknowledge excellencies in the diplomatic corps, um, fellow workers in history, the officials, the secretary, and the undersecretaries and the officials of the Department of Education, mga kaguro ko, marami pong salamat sa inyong tiwala sa akin to tell this story of uh, what happened during the war the Second World War, and our role in that story, especially this inter International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, I would love to share my screen now. My, my paper or my uh, presentation is entitled Remembering the Past and Saving Ourselves Drawing Inspiration from the Initiatives of Former President Manuel L. Quezon in Helping Holocaust Victims Again, I think the Embassy of Israel in the Philippines and the External Partnerships Division of the Department of Education uh, for the trust that they have given me to talk about uh, this topic. Uh, this is not the first time I am doing this. This uh, um, In 2017, I was once called by the former ambassador, His Excellency Effie Ben Matityao, uh, to his office and discussed to me that he wants me to talk about uh, what happened. And I said, you know, I, I know, I, I, I'm familiar with the story, but uh, I'm not really an expert, but uh, he put his trust on me. And that's why on the, uh, on the history convention on August 10, uh, 2017, I gave my talk on uh, this uh, matter. If you have other questions, uh, Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow my social media accounts, and uh, you can also read my website, shouchua.net and bangkanishow.wordpress.com for other information about Philippine history. History should not only tell us about the stories of great men and of nations and of decisions of statesmen. History should teach us about pakikipagkapwa-tao and pagkatao. It should teach us about humanity and seeing ourselves with the other person. We begin the story with what happened in 1935, or in the 1930s, I mean, in the 1930s. Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, the President of uh, the German people, and he basically had this uh, idea. He blamed the Jews for the uh, many, many problems of Germany at that time, including 
the defeat that happened in World War II. And then why, why was that? How, how was he able to do it? Uh, to understand this, we must go further about 2,000 years ago. The Jewish people, of course, we are familiar with them because we read the Bible. Uh, a lot of us Filipinos are Christians. This is the people, of course, where Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ came from. Yeah? This is the people of Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And uh, we all know that their homeland was uh, the Levant, what is now present-day Israel and the surrounding areas. And the problem was, when they were occupied by the Roman Empire, eventually the Romans sacked Jerusalem only a few years after the death of Jesus Christ. And the, Europe, the Jews were scattered around Europe. Uh, this is what happened. They call it the diaspora. And uh, that is why when we, we also term the diaspora of our migrant workers to other countries, this is where this term came from. The diaspora led, as uh, was explained to you earlier, the Jews to live in many parts of Europe. Despite the fact that they were, uh, despite the fact that they were holding on to thousands of years tradition, they were able to keep it. They were able to keep their religion. They were able to keep their culture, despite the fact that they were able to live in other countries. Um, they cannot go back to their land, um, mainly because of resources, but also because other people had. Uh, were already there, and eventually, of course, the British occupied also this area. And so, in many ways, this is a nation, or this was a nation without a country, a nation without a land, a culture, a people without a country. And in many of those countries, the Jews were persecuted. Uh, a lot of them became businessmen. They became successful. But uh, in some areas, like in Russia, there was a pogrom that was instituted by the Tsar. And uh, it also exterminated some of the Jewish population in Russia. So the Holocaust was not the first time that uh, the Jews were persecuted. So this was the context. In Germany, a lot of the Germans became successful. Uh, and of course, there were also German Jews, uh, there were also Jews in America who also became successful in business. Now, Hitler was able to create what we call a class war. In a way, a class war. He was depicting the Germans as struggling, as poor, and he, he, he blamed the German Jews, who were already Germans in many ways. A lot of them intermarried with the Germans. They were producing German offsprings. They were serving in the German army, the German government. These people considered themselves already German. But still holding on, of course, to their Jewish religion and their Jewish tradition. But Hitler was able to, through fake news, fake news, uh, I do not want to call it fake news, distortion, historical distortion, a distortion of information, misinformation, disinformation. Uh, they were able to brainwash a lot of the Germans to this belief that the people who brought down Germany are the Jews. The German Jews and the European Jews. And Hitler was dreaming that uh, this Jewish menace, as, they, as, he, as he called it, would be eliminated throughout Europe. Because this also coincided with his uh, dream of expanding the German uh, country, the German Empire, the Third Reich, all throughout Europe. And so they were able to uh, condition the people. And this is where we see there's a lesson here, ladies and gentlemen, that despite the fact that countries are democratic, 
despite the fact that countries are educated. The people are educated in Germany. They're the, one of the most cultured people in the world. That they, are, that, that they were able to be led to believe uh, that it was the right thing to do to persecute a group of people. This is the tragedy of what happened there. These, these people are the most educated. They're the most cultured people in the world. The most democratic people in the world. And this is a warning to all of us that it doesn't mean that there is democracy and leaders are elected democratically. That it will still not lead to tyranny. That it will still not lead to the centralization of powers. That will still not lead to the persecution of a certain group of people. This is a warning to all of us. This uh, effort to demonize the Jews resulted in what happened on the 9th to 10th November of 1938. This was called the Crystal Knot. When the German population and its, um, and its uh, authorities turned en masse against the Jews. They put the sign Jude and the Star of David in the stores of uh, the Jews to basically humiliate them and to single them out. They smashed these stores. They looted. They burned synagogues. Remember that in the Jewish, the Jewish people, their religion was central. The Jew, their, 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 their faith to, 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 to God was central to their life. And of course, at this night also, some people were taken. And uh, just imagine, your church is not there anymore. Some of your friends are, were not there anymore. They were taken already. Your father, your mother, perhaps your child were taken. This was called the Crystal Nacht or the Night of the Broken Glass because the, the broken glass became the symbol of the persecution of the Jews at that time. Crystal Nacht. Nagliwanag ang gabi. Dahil sa mga basag na salamin. Binasag ang mga salamin ng mga hudyo. Binasag din ang kanilang buhay. Eventually, people were rounded up and were placed in what we call the concentration camps. Despite the fact that the whole world uh, condemned this uh, atrocity, they cannot do so much. And that's why all these people, all these Jews, millions of them were placed in what we call concentration camps to work. But eventually, their fate were sealed in what we call the Vance Conference on January 20, 1942. There were only a few people in that conference. Only a few people decided that these millions of Jews should die as a final solution to the Jewish problem. They will not just be persecuted. They will not just be taken from their homes. That they will be exterminated. This happened January 20, 1942. In this house. And so, a lot of the concentration, eventually there were concentration camps, there were work, uh, there were, there were, they, where they were forced to work, but eventually there would also be the death camps, like this one in Auschwitz-Birkenau, liberated on the 27th of January 1945. That's why we commemorate today the International Holocaust Remembrance Day because of the liberation of this camp. Uh, but what happened inside? those camps. Uh, and not just there, in other places in Europe. And, and 
there was a massive network of concentration camps and death camps. Uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, Bergen-Belsen, Dachau, Buchenwald, Mauthausen, and many others. These are places that are notorious during the Holocaust for what happened there. When you arrive there uh, from, from the trains, uh, all of you were picked up, brought to trains, and were transported to these places. The men, the women, and the children will be separated from each other. And they will be forced to work. But those who are not deemed not fit to work, those who are deemed not well, uh, they will be sent some other places. Those who are those who can work, they will be sent to uh, the 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 concentration camps. You saw the sign Arbeit macht frei. Work makes one free. Uh, but their work that they do will not give them freedom, but will only give them actually death. Some of those who are not so lucky to be placed on the workers' camp where they went straight and these are the conditions in the workers' camp. They were given uniforms. They were given numbers that were tattooed on their bodies and their hands. They were, they were not fed well. And there was malnourishment all around. And those that were not fit to work, some of them were executed. Well, at first they were using bullets. They were shooting people. But eventually they felt that they're just wasting their money with the bullets where they can do it en masse. And of, of course, what happened was they placed these people eventually inside what we call the gas chambers. And to hide their crime, which actually they were able to document fully because they wanted to report to their superiors in Germany that their work was being done. To hide their crime, they tried to burn the bodies uh, into incinerators. But when the... And, and these are actual photographs of the executions that happened with mass graves. And when the... And when the camps were liberated, what happened was the survivors were the ones who have to bury the dead. I'm sorry if I show this picture, but we have to. We have to remember what happened. To the Jewish people, the Holocaust that killed 6 million Jews was called the Shoah. A lot of us remember the Shoah through this little girl who wrote a diary, the diary of a young girl by Anne Frank. Anne Frank was a Jewish uh, girl in the Netherlands. With her family, they hid in a secret annex. But when eventually, after just before the war was supposed to end, uh, the Franks and their companions were discovered, were eventually sent to the death camps. Annelise died. The rest of the family and the rest of the companions died. Only Otto Frank, his father, survived. Of course, they found their diary in the secret. Uh, uh, during the raid, the diaries were found by the Nazis. They did not think it was, you know, important, and so they they did not bring it. Um, this was eventually published and it inspired a lot of people. And not only inspired a lot of people because this diary came from a young girl who, had a, who was always full of hope despite despair. 
but because it let us remember the Holocaust, even if we're not Jewish. Because we can relate to a human being like Anne. There were films, films such as Schindler's List, who talk about Oskar Schindler, a German, uh, a German uh, businessman, a German at that, who was able to save uh, a number of Jews. And of course, his story became famous in Hollywood. What we're saying here is that we also have that kind of story through the, uh, through the efforts of Manuel Quezon. There's also what we call Quezon's List in such a way. But let me begin my story about Quezon with another story, which is a, an apocryphal story, a story, a legend. Uh, some some might, might say an urban legend. That when Jose Rizal was sentenced to death, his mother, Teodora Alonso, went to the governor general in the steps of Malacanang to beg for the life of her son. In that story, it was said that the mother of Jose Rizal was climbing the stairs, kneeling, and uh, was really desperate and was crawling in those steps. That story may not be true, but Manuel Luis Quezon, while he was a younger politician, he heard that story. For the longest time, Malacanian Palace, the seat of power in the country, was occupied by foreigners. And we have to beg for the life of Filipinos with these leaders. In 1935, Manuel Luis Quezon was elected president of the Republic of the, of, of, no, of the Commonwealth of the Philippines. And eventually what, what happened was he designed a ritual every presidential inauguration, which is still being followed today, the ritual climbing of the stairs. Why? Because he said, as I climbed those stairs in Malacanian, as the president of, the, of a free people, we're going to, we're going to climb those stairs heads up. Ipaghihiganti natin ang ginawa kay Jose Rizal, kay Doña Teodora. And during my term, no Filipino should ever beg for his life. And he commuted the death penalty. He did not implement it during his presidency. And so this tells us about Quezon's concept of humanity. He is not perfect. He was not perfect. But in many ways, he exemplified the humanity of a Filipino. During the time when the, the Jews were being persecuted in uh, Germany and in Europe, there was a public clamor in other countries uh, about what was happening in Germany. Uh, they were condemning. But a lot of these countries were not able to do anything to alleviate the sufferings of those people in Germany. Now, some of us are now familiar with the story of how Kesson uh, saved the Jews. Uh, there are many, shall we say, biographies or there are many works that tackle this. One of them is the, uh, the PhD dissertation of Ronnie Har Bonnie Harris uh, from Sabzin to Manila, the Holocaust Odyssey of Joseph Kreisner, Cisner, and the Philippine Rescue of Refugee Jews, which eventually became the book Philippine Sanctuary, a Holocaust Odyssey. And he was talking about, the, he wrote about the Jewish community that was already here even before the war. Uh, Joseph Seisner was one of their, or Cisner was one of their um, leaders here in the Philippines. He, was, he actually uh, was a teacher in my university now, which was at that time De La Salle College. Um, he was one of the leaders here. 
uh, Cantor Joseph Cisner. Uh, but uh, Bonnie Harris talked about how Quezon learned about what they can do with this uh, uh, problem in Germany. Uh, and I quote, Paul V. McNutt, which was the, who was the U.S. High Commissioner to the Philippines, brought the proposal of Jewish refugee rescue to Philippine President Manuel Quezon. An idea discussed between McNutt and Jacob Weiss, a friend and political colleague of McNutt's during his time as governor of Indiana. Jacob's brother Julius worked for a well-known Jewish relief agency in NYC, the Refugee Economic Corporation, and it is he who urged his brother Jacob for the, for the RECs request to discuss the matter with McNutt during a visit, uh, McNutt, during a visit McNutt made to Washington, D.C. in February 1938. Upon his return to the Philippines in March 1938, McNutt took the idea to President Quezon, who fully supported the rescue proposal, and McNutt then turned to the officers of the Jewish community in Manila and asked for their efforts in devising the mechanics for such a rescue plan. Uh, this was Paul V. McNutt. He was the highest uh, U.S. official in the Philippines. At that time, Manuel Quezon, they, we were still uh, under America, under the Commonwealth. So he broached the idea to Manuel Quezon to these discussions with, with the wises. And uh, what happened was they consulted their friends. And this is where the Frieder brothers will come in. The Frieder brothers were famous for their businesses here in the Philippines, including cigars. And uh, they were members of the Jewish Refugee Committee. And so they, uh, and according to a book by Frank Ephraim called Escape to Manila from Nazi Tyranny to Japanese Terror, they talked about these things perhaps uh, according to family stories of the Frieders through a, through a game, through games of poker, where, where Manuel Quezon, High Commissioner McNutt and the Freeders participate in these games of poker. So what, what they devised, the, what the plan that they devised was this. They will offer uh, refugees haven, but of course they were, they, uh, Manuel Quezon was, wanted to do this, uh, but he was, uh, um, he really wanted to do it. He really wanted to do it. And when he was asked uh, why he wanted to do it, because he said, as a Christian, how can I refuse the, uh, the people where our, Jesus, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ belong? So in many ways, his Christianity prevailed and thought of Jesus as a Jew. Huh? And uh, he said, he cannot abandon the people of my Lord. And so what he did was they organized a committee in Manila and Quezon was aware that if the Jews will come here in the Philippines, uh, they, should be, uh, they should be people that we might need, that they will not be part of the problem, uh, so to say. And so what they did was they uh, made a list of jobs that we needed, like physicians, chemical engineers, registered nurses. Remember that the Jewish people in Europe were educated people. And so basically, they, they uh, shall we say, they covered up the rescue by making it appear that they are recruiting people to the Philippines. Okay? And, uh, and so what happened was they, they sent these announcements to newspapers in, in Europe. And uh, all you have to do is to request uh, and uh, request the, the government here, and they're going to choose. And again, the, the choosing the names of these people meant that uh, those who are not chosen, um, we're leaving them. But we have to make the choice. We have to make that difficult choice because uh, we cannot uh, bring everyone in. And so eventually they drew up the list and what, they, what, what, what uh, Paul McNutt did was to coordinate with the Secretary of State and uh, basically he issued visas because he had the power to issue visas, uh, Paul, uh, Paul McNutt, and he asked the American Embassy to process the application and to, to help in the various American embassies in Europe 
uh, uh, to give them passports, to give them visas, to bring them in to the Philippines. And of course, there was no one-way ticket to the Philippines. There was no one-way ticket to the Philippines. Uh, it was a very, very long journey, shall we say. And what happened was, of course, uh, the first batch of, shall we say, um, the first batch of um, Jewish refugees came here by October of 1938, if I'm not mistaken. And this was even before Kristallnacht. This was even before Kristallnacht, the first arrived. So it was not just one big, you know, migra um, migration of people here. It was really uh, by batches. And by November, as we all know, after the Kristallnacht happened on November 9 to 10, by 19 November 1938, the Filipino people reacted to what was happening in, uh, Germ in Germany. And uh, the Filipino people basically um, supported the moves of the president to settle the Jews here in the Philippines. Uh, and of course, not everyone was lucky. A lot of those who were able to be saved and went to Manila, they were like the last people to come out. Because just after they were able to be, um, to, to, they were able to come out of Europe, the borders closed and they cannot get out anymore. Uh, and eventually, of course, um, they cannot leave. And those who cannot leave, of course, um, you know what happened to them already. There was also a proposal to open Mindanao because there were 1,300 Jews that were already here. Quezon wanted 10,000 more. And we will put them to Min in Mindanao. And some of the, uh, some of the officials in, uh, some of the officials did not like the idea. Some people resisted it. Emilio Aguinaldo was quite open that this might be trouble. And so uh, Quezon really wanted to do it. But of course, what happened was in 1941, December 8, World War II already started in the Philippines. And they cannot do it anymore. And so uh, this was the story of the uh, Jewish rescue in the Philippines. And there was a filmmaker who actually made uh, a film about that Jewish rescue. Uh, uh, I actually met them while they were doing the film, Russell Hodge and Cynthia Scott Johnson. Uh, um, uh, I met them when they visited Manila when, while they were making the film uh, with some of their families. And some of the people were actually part of the Jews who were, these were the, uh, some of the people I met were the Jewish, uh, they were the descendants of the Jews that were saved in Manila. They made this, they made this film called Rescue in the Philippines, Refuge from the Holocaust. And I would like to show you some excerpts uh, if you allow me. The 1930s were a dark time in Europe. The Nazi party steadily moving toward the final solution of what they called their Jewish problem. Stormtroopers swept across Germany and Austria, burning synagogues, smashing and looting Jewish businesses, and sending tens of thousands to concentration camps. I still have nightmares to this day. Jewish families quit their jobs, packed up their belongings, and fled for their lives. Many, even most, found there was nowhere to go. Nation after nation closed their borders. On the other side of the world, however, one nation opened its doors. More than a thousand people attended a rally in Manila saying that Hitler had violated the inherent right of every man to freedom, life, and the pursuit of happiness. And to newly elected President Manuel Quezon, it was not a question of whether his country would help, but why other nations did not. Other countries perhaps did not think it that important. I, I don't presume to say. But I know that Dad had the moral courage to do it because he believed in the sanctity of human life 
and the right of people to live life as they believe they should. President Quezon showed the highest cards when he said simply, it's the right thing to do. In the end, a deal made over poker, bourbon and cigars would mean escape for over 1,300 European Jews. Most Filipinos are familiar with Schindler's List. Very few Filipinos know that uh, Quezon was in his own way a kind of Schindler. Saying that the Filipinos would be glad that when the time of need came, their country was willing to extend a hand of welcome, Quezon opened his country and even a portion of Marikina, his private estate, to the desperate refugees. And the second mail, we got an announcement, a letter that said you've been accepted for a position in the Philippines. We went to the Philippines because it was the only place that gave us a visa. We were the last train out of Berlin. They, they closed the border. We were able to go to the Philippines and escape that. <laughs> At that time, we were really free. Manuel Quezon died before his country was liberated, but the link to Jewish freedom was not forgotten. In 1947, the Philippines was the only country in Asia to vote for the partitioning of Palestine, leading to the creation of the State of Israel. In a memorial park outside Tel Aviv, the Open Doors Monument stands in mute testimony to the Philippines, a nation that stood firm on the basic principle of shared humanity, battling hatred with the simple weapon of an open heart. Wow. So, as it was said in the documentary, to prove his sincerity, uh, putting his money where his mouth was, Manuel Luis Quezon placed a uh, um, a portion of his estate or, or, or gave a portion of his estate to be part of the settlement where the Jews will be in. Uh, the, what we call the famous Marikina estate. And these are the uh, some photos provided to me by the Israeli embassy for uh, during the dedication of Marikina Hall, uh, uh, April 23, 1940, which were Marikina Hall, uh, the main hall of the estate of Quezon, was, of course, uh, in a way, was his, uh, dedicated to the Jews. And Manuel Quezon, in that uh, speech, he said, it is my hope, and indeed my expectation. It is my hope and indeed my expectation that the people of the Philippines will have in the future every reason to be glad that when the time of need came, their country was willing to extend a hand of welcome. So, these were the families of Jews who were present at that time. Uh, and uh, that was a very important occasion to many of them. After the Second World War, of course, eventually, we have a role. The Philippines had a role again in the history of the Israeli people. When we became the only Asian nation to vote in the United Nations for the creation of the state of Israel. And, of course, by 1969, the government of Israel passed a resolution exempting Filipinos from visa requirements in respect of their role in the eve of World War II. In 1947. So that's why uh, even today the Israel and Philippines relations is very strong. There is an open doors monument, a park in Israel um, that is, um, shall we say, uh, dedicated to the Philippines and also to Manuel Quezon who is uh, honored by Israel as one of the righteous among nations. His grandson, Manuel Quezon III, and I would like to give the floor to him in a, a video, will tell us of a touching uh, moment where he met one of the uh, 
uh, the the one of the um, people who were saved by Manuel Quezon. Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. Your Excellency, the Ambassador of Israel, good evening. Nais ko pong humingi sa inyo ng ilang minuto lamang upang ikwento sa inyo ang aking nadaanan at kung paano ko nalaman ang kwento tungkol sa aking lolo Nagsimula ito sa isang email. Meron akong natanggap na email na galing sa isang Amerikano at ang pangalan niya ay Frank Ephraim. Kinuwento niya na meron siyang sinulat na libro. Ang libro na ito ay tungkol sa kwento ng mga katulad niya na nagal sa balutan mula sa Germany, mula sa Austria, mula sa mga iba't ibang bahagi ng Europa dahil nais na silang patayin ng mga Nazi. Nung panahon na yon, hindi pa naganap ang ikalawang digmaang pandaydig. Walang bansang gustong tumanggap sa mga Hudyo. Yung iba, nakapunta sa Britanya. Ang konti nakapunta sa Amerika. Ngunit libo-libo sa kanila ay walang mahanap na lugar na mapupuntahan. Merong ilang magkapatid na mga negosyante. Ang pangalan nila ay The Freeder Brothers. Sila ay may mga negosyo dito sa Pilipinas at lumapit sila sa pinuno ng ating uh, pamahalaan ng panahon na yon at sinabi nila, hindi ba ninyo pwede tanggapin ang ilan sa aming mga kalahi na ngayon walang mapuntahan. Ang sinulat na report ng isa sa mga kapatid na ito, sinabi niya, nakausap ko ang presidente ng Pilipinas at simple lang ang naging sagot niya sa amin. Ang sinabi niya, bilang kristyano, paano ko ba matatanggihan ang kalahi ng ating Panginoong Heso Kristo. Sa simpleng sagot na yon nagsimula ang, ang katakot-takot na pagpaplano, paghihingi ng mga permiso. Saan ba sila pupunta? Ilan ba sa kanila ang makakapunta dito? Saan ba sila ilalagay? At hindi po sa pagmamalaki, ngunit sa pag-share din sa inyo, dahil lahat sa atin alam natin na ang mahalagang pagbibigay ay ang pagbibigay na talagang atin at hindi sa ibang tao. Ang sinabi ng aking lolo ay, kung wala silang mapupuntahan, meron din akong maliit na lupa doon sa may marikina, doon sila pwede manirahan. Sa libro ni Frank Ephraim, Meron din siyang kinuot. Ang araw ay Abril 23, 1940. At ito ang sinabi ng aking lolo sa unang grupo ng mga Hudyo na dumating mula sa Europa at pumunta at nanirahan sa Marikina sa bahay na tinawag nilang Marikina Hall. Ang sinabi niya, It is my hope and indeed my expectation that the people of the Philippines will have in the future every reason to be glad that when the time of need came, their country was willing to extend a hand of welcome. Alam niyo po ang mga bagay na ganito, mga kwento tungkol sa mga taong yumao na, mga panahon na nakaraan na, ay may kahalagaan dahil nung pumunta ako sa Amerika, sa Ohio, kung saan na-meet ko ang mga pamilyang Frieder, si Mr. Ephraim, at ang isang grupo ng mga Hudyo na, na ang pangalan nila The Center for Holocaust, and humanity education. May lumapit sa akin na isang matandang hudyo. 
At sabi niya sa akin, ang pangalan ko ay Mr. Price. Hindi mo ako kilala. Ngunit, nung binanggit mo yung talumpati ng iyong lolo, nandun ako. Teenager lang ako ng panahon na yun. At lumapit agad ako sa kanya nung pauwi na siya at kinamayan ko siya. Hindi mo naman abutan ng lolo mo, hindi ba? Sabi niya sa akin. At sabi ko, hindi po. At sabi niya, ako, naabutan ko siya. Ako, kinamayan ko siya. Ako, ay nandito dahil sa kanya. At ngayon, kakamayan kita at nahawakan mo na rin ang kamay ng iyong lolo. Alam niyo po, napakagandang pakiramdam nito. Kahit ang layo na ng dumaan na panahon, sa sandaling iyon, parang ako na rin ang nandun sa Marikina at naramdaman ko ang sigla at tuwa ni Mr. Price. Kaya sa ngalan po ng aming pamilya, nagpapasalamat kami sa inyo, ngunit siguro naman mag agree tayo na isa lang lamang ang dapat bigyan ng parangal. Isa lang ang dapat nating pasalamatan ang ating Panginoon. Wow. Wow. And uh, hindi lang po yan ginawa natin sa mga Jews. After the war, the white Russians in China who were evicted, displaced by the Russian Revolution of 1917. They were at that time residing already in uh, China, in Shanghai in 1949. But in 1949, October, the communists took over China and because they were anti-communist, anti-Bolsheviks at that. The white Russians' lives were in danger. And nobody wanted to take them in. 6,000, or shall we say 5,500 of them. And it was President Quirino who decided we should take them in. We should take them in. And 6,000 white Russians, or 5,500 white Russians were resided in Giwan, Eastern Samar. And we were just a newly independent country at that time. Wala pa tayong sampung taon noon. But what happened was, in one of those cards you will see, the uh, ID cards of those, the evacuees, the white Russian evacuees in Samar. It was placed there that the bearer of the card is therefore under the legal protection of the Republic of the Philippines. Imagine, we are protecting a people. We were protecting these people. And we were still a stillborn country, or a, a newborn country. During the war in Vietnam and Indochina, the conflicts there, we also accepted what we call the boat people, and we settled them in many in, in some parts of the country, including Bataan. Yen po ang pakikipagkapwa ng Pilipino. In 2022, we commemorated the 500 years of the arrival of Magellan. They were also famished. We took them in. We fed them. They were dying at that time. If if we did not feed them, their journey wouldn't have continued to complete the first circumnavigation of the world. Talagang ang ating mga ninuno, ang bayang Pilipino ay bayan ng pakikipagkapwa-tao. But there are also times in our history where Filipinos killed fellow Filipinos and we have divided among each other. You know, we should always look at Manuel Quezon and see, you know, it maybe the 6 million Jews The genocide of six million. A lot of genocides are happening in the world today, and we should condemn them. But you know, if there's one thing that we can do, 
is to stop the hate in our heart for other people. To stop the hate that we have when people have different opinions or are different from who we are. We remember Quezon and we remember that when we honor humanity, when we honor the rights of other people, we are abiding by our sacred constitution that was approved by the majority of the people in 1987. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of information, freedom of investigation and due process, freedom from torture, forced violence, threat, and intimidation. And we should see that if we really learn the lessons of the Holocaust and the Shoah, we should bring it to our personal lives, to our everyday lives. Because when we respect human rights, we love our country and we love humanity. Because heroism begins with the decision to love. With the decision to see your kapwa to see yourself in the other, even if sometimes it is difficult to express this love. I would like to end with three statements. One coming from Annelise Frank, from her diary, where she said, in spite of everything, In spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. The Talmud, which is a scripture, uh, one of the great scriptures of the Jewish people, once said, whoever saves one life, saves the whole world in time. Magligtas ka ng isang buhay, ay parang nailigtas mo na rin ang buong sangkatauhan. When we remember the past and learn its lessons, we also save ourselves. Never forget. Never forget. Thank you very much. Shalom. Alaikum. Thank you very much, Professor Xiao Chua, for that very comprehensive and passionate discussion. Indeed, the history reflects the Philippines' deep commitment to attain a world that adheres to humanity and equality, regardless of race, culture, beliefs, and country. To further discuss the implications of the Holocaust and the open-door policy of the Philippines to today's world, we shall now proceed to the most awaited part of our symposium, the talk show. Joining us as our panelists are DepEd Under Secretary Tonisito MC Umali, Esquire, and our speakers, Dr. David Deutsch and Professor Xiao Chua. If you have some questions in mind, kindly type them in our chat box. Our team will be collating your questions in a while for our panelists to answer. And to lead the facilitation, may we call on the moderator of the talk show, the Project Development Officer for from the External Partnerships Service. We now turn you over to Mr. Rolly B. Soriano. Thank you very much, Ma'am Daisy and Sir Janor. Good afternoon to all the participants and viewers of this important event, the commemoration and symposium on the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. We have heard a lot from the presentations of our resource persons, and we wanted to learn more about the event in the history. 
Our panelists will be talking about the Holocaust in the deeper sense, and we will be asking questions. Our virtual participants will be given a chance to ask their questions live via Zoom. And for our online viewers, we can type in your, you can type in your questions on the chat box or at the comment section of the live streaming via DepEd Philippines Facebook page. Our secretariat will be gathering all your questions and we will try to accommodate them all. Our resource persons, Dr. David Deutsch, Professor Chow Tuwa and Undersecretary Tonisito Omali will be our panelists for this exchange of thoughts. Good afternoon, Dr. Deutsch, Professor Chua, and Yusik Omali. Hello. 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 Makasaysa ang hapon ulit. Raleigh. Makasaysa ang hapon po. Yeah. Raleigh, first I'm, I'm of, on, yeah, first Raleigh, of. Raleigh, Raleigh. Before that, so so this since this is the talk show portion, I am I'm also here more uh, as uh, also uh, submitting some questions to our uh, resource person. So it's, it's more like that. That should be more of uh, the, the role. Yes, you I, said. I, yes. Do you, yes, do you have you questions said. there right now, Rolly? Uh, right now, yes, you. you said first of all, may we, yeah, first of all, may we ask our panelists, including you, you said, Tony, to talk about the measures taken by the Nazis against the Jews and if there is a plan to murder the Jews from the beginning of the Nazis regime. Yeah, but but before that, Rolly, I, I really appreciate that question. I think but that, that those questions should be answered by Doc uh, Deutsch and uh, Doc uh, Chua. Can we ask Doc Deutsch? Well, again, uh, what, what is anti-Semitism? And did this actually start only during the Holocaust uh, when Nazis targeted the Jews? So again, so that our listeners, our children, our teachers will know, why is there anti-Semitism? Uh, anybody could answer, please, uh, Rolly, if we could ask Dr. David Deutsch, please. Yes, I, I heard the question. Thank you for that wonderful question. Thank you. Um, you know, but there are two separate questions. The question of why is there anti-Semitism is, I don't know if I could fully answer. I, can, I don't know. I don't know. But, but I could answer how it was, what are the reasons for it, and how it changed. Th those are separate questions. And, and, and um, I can say that there's a big difference between anti-Semitism and notice the ism at the end that evolved with modernity and with anti, I would say, Judaism, which is something a bit different. Up until the mid early, I say, or even mid 18th, 19th century, if you take it a bit longer, the, a great deal of the Jewish population was religiously oriented and the hate against them wasn't directed on the basis of race. It was directed at them at the basis of Christ killers. Sorry to say this, but that was the perception of the, 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 the Catholic church for so many years. And it, it went not only into the Catholic church, that you come from, from Christian backgrounds, this is very helpful because also in the Protestant church, when Luther, understood that the Jews will not convert, no matter how nice he is, he changed his approach and say, all the Jews sh should be replaced, we should replace their heads overnight, things like that, he said. He really, so anti-Judaism as a different religion that made Christians and Muslims and, and other religions sort of scared of them, that existed all the time. There was hatred towards them as religious people, even when they converted. In the 19th, 20th century, things change because many Jews also become secular and also the systems become secular. You therefore cannot prosecute, you, can, you can't build their hate on the basis of religion. And there are new ideas that come into play, which are eugenics and ethnic thinking and racism. So when you take all that heritage of anti-Judaism, all that background of, Christ, of, of, of hate of the Jews on the basis of religion, and fuel that, you understand the connection? That is the fuel for the modern era. And then they say, they translate that hatred into a nationalistic one. 
the Jews no longer hated for his religion, but for his race, for his background, for his genes, so to speak. Not only Jews, I mean, this was an approach, an international approach, also against what we call uh, a gypsies Roma. They were also defined by some systems. And so I'm saying this for you to understand that what fueled the modern anti-Semitism that is based on racism and based on ethnic categories was many, many years of anti-Judaism, but there is a difference between the two. So yeah. anti-Semitism means the new version. Hatred of Jews, not because of their religion and not because of it, but based on their just being Jewish. And it entails today having these images of Jews, like the Jews rich. I've had that. Why, why are you so rich, you Jews? <laughs> My grandfather yeah. from, from Germany was not rich. Yeah. He had a very, so this is anti-Semitism is a modern thing yeah. based on racial profiling. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Yosef, I'm sorry, I would like to follow up yes. uh, an answer because in yes, many ways this is also one. this is also reflected what uh, our good professor here said about the plight also of some of us uh, in the Filipino Chinese community. Now I'm not really I'm not uh, I, I'm not practicing Chinese culture, but I am proud that uh, I do have uh, Chinese heritage. But uh, in many ways, people, there are stereotypes about, you know, Chinese being rich. And then in the 1960s, there was also anti, if there's anti-Semitic, uh, uh, because it, as Semitic came from, if I'm not mistaken, I hope I am correct. It came from Shem, who was one of the sons of Noah. That's why, uh, so that our teachers would also know. Uh, Shem, the son of Noah, that's why anti uh, that's why we have Semites. The, the, Jews, the Jews were Semites and anti-Semitism. There's also uh, anti, uh, sin, in a way, Sinitic, because the Chinese people here in the Philippines, uh, even before the West Philippine Sea problem, were well, already uh, in many ways uh, being uh, stereotyped as abusive, as rich. And uh, this is not always, the, this is not the case in many ways. We profess our being Filipino. We are Filipinos. And we work uh, also. Uh, for the betterment of this country. And I do hope that this uh, racial uh, tensions will also end because we have a problem with the government. I mean, some of us have a problem with the government should be handled diplomatically. And we should, yeah. we Filipinos, we love the Chinese people. Thank you. We appreciate that intervention, Professor Chow. If you may, Rolly, please, one more question, okay? Then please uh, yes, answer, I, I mean, ask again the question. Please read again because... That's very relevant after this question that uh, I, I would like to ask again, Doc David. But before that, uh, thank you very much, Professor Chow Chua, for contextualizing what uh, is uh, going on uh, during the time, uh, 1930s, 1940s, uh, during the time of Nazi Germany uh, in relation to uh, 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 hatred for the Jews and how it may also happen here in our country, for example. You were giving our countries an example, right, Doc Chua? Or maybe other yes. countries too, right? Yes. Uh, mm. the, 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 for, 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 for maybe uh, for, for Chinese, right? Uh, right. For, for, the, for the reasons, uh, unfounded reasons that you have uh, uh, shared. But of course, Professor Chow, it was not done in the same magnitude right. as it was done during the time of Nazi Germany. So this is my question, and please ask your question, uh, Doc Rol, uh, Rolly. Doc David, so tell us, our teachers are listening right now, our parents, our learners, how can a party, a Nazi party, uh, that is almost unbelievable, whose basic ideology is, is, is based on anti-Semitism, you know, assume power you know uh in germany g g give us an idea how did it even happen and then you you, you uh, I'm, I'm just trying to digest how the, the german people will embrace that basic ideology and by the way doc david just like what you said is that also uh the, not, not the jews are uh, not only being discriminated because uh, nazis right the believe that they belong or the german people belong to a superior aryan race right doc david and the Jewish people belong to the lowest race. So can you tell something more about this Nazi party? How did it assume power 
based on this kind of ideology? How did they even win, uh, Doc David? That's a very, very good question. And I think that, that this has to do with, uh, uh, um, first of all, true, their ideology is an ideology of what we call scapegoating, meaning Germany had problems as a country, very, very serious problems, financial problems, instability, political polarity, uh, uh, um, you know, unemployment. Who's to blame? Who can we blame? Now, let's take it to people. You know, a good person says, okay, I want to fix myself. I will take responsibility over my flaws. A person that doesn't want to fix his flaws, what he does, all of my flaws are someone else's. In psychology, we call that projection, right? I project on another person. So Germany needed a scapegoat. That's one element. So how did ideology say? We're much better. The only reason why we're not doing well is because of that. That's the base. And now the second element, which you must understand, it's crucial. It has to do with a system of modern political parties. You cannot understand Nazi party without understanding they're a modern political party. And as a modern political party, what do I want? I want votes. I want people to follow me. What do I, what do I address? I address the lowest common denominator. How do I do that? I target a group. I can get people to vote for me if I tell everyone to hate together. Many people want to see the Holocaust as an outcome of a vicious person just doing this and having intent. That is also true, but that's not enough. That's never enough. You need a system, a political system. You need to, so what did the Nazis do? We, were, we talk about the Nazis from 33. We forget the fact the Nazi party was only 2% at the beginning. And from 26 to 33, they grow and grow. And how do they grow? They appeal to the lowest common denominator. They scapegoat the Jews. And they say, if we just take care of them, we'll do better. And they use that to get political power. Because in Germany, hatred and, and, and discrimination of minorities, you were, uh, uh, you were valued for it and you uh, um, acquired votes because of it. So that's, that's where some people went. I, I doubt, you know, most of the political parties in Germany forget about Nazis. Either conservative political party was racist also, was not as racist as Nazis, but racism was an accepted thing. So really? when you ask me that question, I say it has to do with two things. A, ideology of scapegoating, the yeah. other, and using that. And two, the, syst the modern system of political dynamics. Yeah. And our learners, our students, our teachers should study the Holocaust because it teaches them what are the signs one should be aware of. When yeah. is the time to say, stop? Those are the part of the values we take. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Doc David. If uh, Raleigh, can, uh, Professor Chow can, uh, you know, comment and maybe contextualize uh, the question and apply it to what's going on in the Philippines, please. And then uh, please read all your questions now, Raleigh. Then I'll intervene again later. Thank you. Yes, you said, Prof Chow. Uh, okay. Um, well, it's very hard. What what was. Uh, you know, was uh, asked of me of the uh, undersecretary or a good undersecretary without hurting feelings because this same thing is happening now in our country. No? We're not talking about uh, another foreign people or a, 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 a people in the country with a foreign heritage. We're not even talking about that. We're talking about each other. When we already divided ourselves into political lines, and instead of, for example, before we were attacking the people in power. So if I am a supporter of one candidate, I will attack the people in power. But today we are attacking each other. And I hope that, again, uh, we might not commit a crime as great a magnitude as the Holocaust, but as I but as I always said, the the, the atrocities of the his, of history, the great atrocities of history, begin with the with an angry heart. One angry heart is all it takes to begin such um, uh, crime. 
against other people. And so, I hope that we bring back respect towards our own people, our, our own, even if they believe otherwise, with our, you know, with our, uh, with what we believe in in politics. Uh, we should bring back respect uh, because each one of us have the right to have our own political uh, leanings, our own political beliefs uh, in this country. Because that is um, what is, shall we say, enshrined in our uh, sacred constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Rolly, Prof. Chow, Dr. Deutsch. Rolly, 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 before that, Dr. Yes, David, yes, please confirm the German political party system is a multi-party system, right? It is unlike the American two-party, the Republicans and the Democrats, right? Even now, before and presently, it's a multi- How many political parties do you have in your Bundestag, in the German parliament, Doc David? How many? So that the, 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 our listeners will, the viewers can uh, have an idea. I, I, I will say today, the base there stay, I'd say there are two main parties like, in, like in, in most places, but they lean on about four other small parties to create a coalition. Now it changes because they're always growing in small, uh, uh, changing parties in Germany. At the time, again, there were also a similar amount of parties. Um, I am a scholar of Nazi time and not of contemporary Germany. However, the, the system is not that different than before Nazi than before Nazi Germany. The system is not that different as far as that is a parliamentary government system. But what I will say about the pre-Nazi time that's very important. Unlike today's German political system, where the two leading parties that get most of the votes are indeed right and left, but but very yeah. closely together, morally yeah. central centralized, the, the parties that were getting power in the late 20s and early 30s were very extreme. The fascist yeah. parties and the communist parties, which means both the system was very, very polarized. The reason why Hitler came to power, politically speaking, is because the system was so polarized that it went to another election and another election and another election until the point where they, despite the fact that they didn't want to make a chancellor, they did. So that I'm saying, uh, uh, as far as the difference, and yes, it, it diverges to to uh, a, a very similar system today of a multi-party system. Thank you, Dr. David. Raleigh, you have the floor, please. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Yusik Doni. Thank you, uh, Professor Chao Chua and uh, Dr. David Deutsch. Uh, we heard about ideology, racial discrimination, and even political powers. And that's are the factor of this all uh, happening in the, our, in the history. Uh, Rali, Rali, our secretary, yes, Mam Liling, uh, 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 raise her hand. Mam Liling, please, ma'am. Uh, hi. Um, my uh, my consultation <laughs> is addressed to, uh, to 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 David and to uh, uh, Professor Chua. Um, perhaps we must consider the role of communication and propaganda in uh, in the entire uh, horrific, horrible experience of the Holocaust. Because when, when I went to Israel, and that was uh, in the 70s, and as I reviewed again all the material of what was done to the Jewish people, and I asked myself, how can a, a country of intelligence, uh, uh, seemingly rational people, be led by one person, be manipulated into to this orgy of, of, of hatred. And I think it is meaningful to us at present because uh, the role of propaganda and communications is, is, is crucial not only in the relationships of countries, of races, but also even of, of leadership and citizenship. For example, the idea that the, everything that is happening in a particular country is, is, is terrible. 
or the idea that uh, a person is totally uh, evil, repeated and repeated and repeated, uh, even by those who consider themselves as rational and as academics. So perhaps uh, it would be good to look at how communications and propaganda propagated this idea of a superiority of a race, this idea of the problems of a country being blamed on, on a, a particular minority, uh, we, which still happens uh, at this time, uh, where you know truth and lies finally, it, well, it was Goebbels himself who said that uh, a lie which is repeated often enough then becomes the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very important and a relevant question for, 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 for many countries where you have uh, international opinions shaped and based on repeated exaggerations or repeated lies mixed in with repeated truths. So, so uh, perhaps uh, that it would be useful. I'm thinking in terms, for example, of how do we um, integrate the story of, of the Holocaust in, in our curriculum? How do we teach uh, 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 the children, our learners? But, and of course, we, we start with the teachers. We start, we, we start with, the, with, with the teachers and, and, and so on. So, Yon, uh, I want to ask David, what's the role of propaganda here and information? How can an entire country, you know, seeing all that? And I saw that when I went to the museum, and that was 50 years ago. It, it must be much better now. But, but, but one wonders how an entire country can be drawn into a murderous frenzy over, over a, 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 a minority and which has happened again and again. So at this time, information, propaganda, communication is important. And if you want to teach our learners the lessons of the Holocaust, but, but then that is not for you to answer, David. That's not for you to answer. It's for all of us in the community to answer. But in the experience of the Holocaust, how important was communication? How important was propaganda? That you can sway in educated people, it's so-called superior people, into a, 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 as I said, into a murderous frenzy, which you can only, uh, you know, and my second question also is, uh, this is to David. Uh, I was so moved and so touched because I saw, I visited the museum physically and I saw all those, uh, all those, uh, the exhibits at that time. But how about children who, how do you go about it? And this goes back again to information. This goes back again to communication and perhaps to Professor Chu, how do you present the story? So teachers will be touched. So learners will be touched, even if they don't see the museum, even if they don't see all those evidences of, 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 of the terrible things that, that, that were done to the, to the Jewish people. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just sharing. I was already thinking, how do we go about about uh, uh, teaching? Or, or I am a little familiar because, as I said, uh, uh, because uh, we we have a Jewish uh, a family which traces itself to Jewish roots and highly respected and so on, right in my home island and. We, so we heard the story, but how about, you know, our, our children at present? Your propaganda and information, which is a, a very uh, powerful tool at this time, when truth becomes 
lies and lies become truth and one has no way of telling the difference. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe Professor Chow, yeah. please. Is, is, go, go ahead, Roddy. Yeah, if we may ask uh, Dr. David Deutsch to address the question of our secretary. Um, maybe Professor Chow will begin, then I'll do after, or? Yeah. Okay, I, uh, I'll begin very shortly. This is a start. This what, what we're doing now is a good start. What, I think this is the very first time I've heard that there is a, in a way, a publicized national commemoration of the Holocaust. I think this is the very first one. I mean, I've never seen a television uh, ever, shall we say, a television ever commemoration of the Holocaust that was beamed live. And earlier on, we were watched oh, by about... This Secretary of Education, the much maligned Secretary of Education. <laughs> yes, yes ma'am, ma Liling. Uh, I mean, the history uh, the webinars that we have had started on your watch. So I thank you for that. And of course, the, the, the removal of Philippine high school, uh, of Philippine history in high school was not your fault. Uh, you, uh, but yeah, it was not your fault, I would say that. But again, even you, um, Madam Secretary, even today expressed that more should be done. Because the disinformation that is happening about history, about uh, whatever, uh, is is very much on a large scale, and they they put in money on this. That's why it's 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 very important to stress the 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 importance of the deaf ed teachers because you know we do not have money to counter this. We do not have money. We do not have the resources, but we have the deaf ed teachers, uh, and we have uh, many many documentaries that are around that they can show in their online classes. Uh, maybe the deaf end if it because you know uh, the 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 Holocaust is part of world history, but uh, we can also put it in Philippine history in grade six because you can put Quezon, uh, you yes. can study it under the presidency of Quezon. You can also put it in Avalin sa pagpapakatao. Maybe you say Kumali, there can be modules with the Ayala Foundation on the Holocaust and why Filipinos should learn about the Holocaust and our connection to it. There are so many things that we can do, but even while waiting for those efforts from the Department of Education, this is a very good start. Our teachers actually are already uh, teaching a lot of these things to their learners, and uh, that's why we salute the heroism of the teachers. They are our weapon, despite the fact that we have no resources against this, uh, this uh, uh, very, very massive scale disinformation about the Holocaust, about many things uh, in history. So, uh, Madam Secretary, I thank you because you represent all our deaf ed teachers. And I thank all the deaf ed teachers because you wake up in the morning, you are the heroes because you always think, what would I read? So that I would say right things. Because a lot of leaders in the world are giving misinformation while the teachers of deaf ed are waking up to say, I want to teach what is right and I would read and I would watch documentaries and I would uh, read credible sources uh, so that I would, not, uh, I would not give wrong information to my students. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Chua. Yusik Tony, before we allow Dr. David to answer. Uh, our ambassador, Ilan Flus, is also raising his hand, and we would like to invite you to also join us. Uh, can we highlight Ambassador Ilan Flus? And then we allow Dr. David to address the question. Ambassador, please. No, let me respond after Dr. Deutsch will respond. I was pleased, Dr. Deutsch, you can respond, and I have a few comments. Thank you. Uh, how to make it relevant? Look, uh, this is my job. How to I teach Holocaust studies in South Africa, in the DRC, in Japan, in China, in mainland, and, and this is a very good question, how to make it, and I think there's, there's actually quite a simple answer to that. Individual stories. Individ when you, when I noticed Irina's here, Irina's a good friend of mine, a colleague, I work with her for years, 
And I noticed as soon as she, she spoke, all of the energies of whoever was online, I felt it changed that second. Why? Because that's a piece of history as it was. That's, she tells her own story. That's why I put online, Yad Vashem has done a clips of 20 minutes each and of 30 minutes of survivors. Rina also has her clip there as well. Hi, Rina. And, and, and um, I think the, the best way, if I want to, to, to say it accurately and simply, is if you want your learners to learn about the Holocaust, bring a story, an individual story, because in every story there are human dilemmas. There's how did they survive? There's the hope, there's the, the pain, there's, and through a story, you could teach history because the story happens in the context of history. It doesn't happen on the moon. So you begin with a story. I, I work with educators all the time. I tell them, begin with a story. All of the students are on board. And then through that story, you could reach uh, contemporary issues. You could reach historical context, et cetera, et cetera. So I recommend, simply put, using individual stories, materials, objects. I put on the chat box our testimony list of 20 to 30 minutes testimonies and our lesson plans to use it. So you may copy paste it. Furthermore, I think that in the future cooperation with your ministries of education and with teacher training programs, we have that extensively in, in, in other places. We have that in India with thousands of teachers and students. And, and hopefully in the future, this could be a wonderful endeavor that we all will benefit from. Thank you for that question. And again, as I said, individual stories. Thank you, Dr. Deutz. Can we hear from the ambassador? Ambassador, please. Yes, thank you very much. And I want again to say thank you for this fascinating uh, panel. And uh, I want to join and uh, uh, really express my appreciation uh, to DEPED and to uh, the secretary also for your comments. Actually, this partnership with uh, the Department of Education, we see this as a strategic partnership because of the teachers, the education system, because the only way to get the message out to the younger generation is together with the Department of Education. And what we would like to see that this event is not the first and the last one, but from here, we can continue either with the curriculum and find ways how to, uh, how to bring the message um, of tolerance and all, all the issues that we discussed here today to bring the message to the younger generation. And we would like to see this uh, continuation, how it can continue vis-a-vis -vis Israel. So Yad Vashem has also a school of teaching the teachers and they can work together with you in developing those programs for the teachers. Uh, and Yad Vashem has experience all around the world in all continents and they can work with you in adjusting uh, to the local uh, culture and local uh, interests. And then the second thing is that we have here the Philippine Jewish connection and with the story of President Quezon and giving the 1300 Jews. So this immediately makes it, and, I, and, you, and it, it's a fascinating story. And there are quite a few papers written about it. I want to thank also the professor for his really fascinating uh, presentation here. Uh, really, really fascinating. Uh, so there's a lot in common. We just have to work on it and to make to go out to the public in different ways. Um, and as also Dr. Deutsch said, Rina, Rina Quint, who is a survivor, she got only 10 minutes before. But I know from her and I had with her a few discussions, she would be very happy. And usually she would sit and have uh, one hour, one and a half hours with people because there are so many questions. And she has the first hand, and thought, I mean, she's a survivor. And she has a fascinating story. It, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult story uh, with her experiences, but still uh, she, she said, I mean, uh, and David said that, uh, that the survivors are optimistic when they, uh, uh, they are, they're looking to the future and not looking, looking to the past to remember, but looking to, to the future to build new life. So uh, Rina has even stayed here with us the entire symposium and I think it would be uh, good and uh, would be interesting for us also maybe to hear from her her thoughts about the issues we discussed today and Rina said she will be able to join any kind of symposium in the coming uh, future we'll be happy to uh, facilitate 
and and get to meet uh, other um, in in other kind of settings that uh, that they would like to do it. So again, thank you very much. And uh, as I suggest, just to let uh, Rina say a few more words. Yes, thank you, Ambassador Floss. Uh, can we give a highlight to Marina to join our uh, discussion this afternoon? Our technical team, please. So we heard about the possible integration in the curriculum, uh, um, the, uh, making modules about Holocaust. And uh, uh, I think uh, um, some of the important lessons uh, uh, are to be identified para mas lalong ma, ma, ma enrich yung ating knowledge about the Holocaust. And uh, I think Ma'am Rina, with her uh, uh, first-hand experience of the Holocaust, can share with us something, Ma'am Rina? Um, are you talking to me, Rina? Rina, yes. Yes, I thank yes. you very much for this opportunity. I would like very much to invite all of you come to Jerusalem or not in Jerusalem person, at least at Zoom. I was very nervous speaking for 10 minutes because I didn't know how much I can tell you of my 86 years of life. 86 years and 10 minutes is a very short time. But I am very grateful to you, first of all, for allowing 1,300 people to be saved and then for continuing this now in the year 2022. We can make peace and we have to make peace. And you started a very good, uh, it's a very good start and I hope we will all continue. And good luck to all of you and thank you very much. Also thank for- uh, Rolly, for uh, information on uh, people, when Rena was talking, there were more than 5,000 viewers. Yes, you're I'm all welcome to call me. You can call me or then Zoom 5, 000, to me huh? or ask David Deutsch. Or, who were I'll listening. be glad to speak to everyone. Which is more effective than, you know, 50 people inside a lecture hall. For, yes. For more yes, than 5,000 uh, and, and giving their uh, reactions as well. And one thing to hear more from, from Brenna. I, I, I just want to tell you that I'm the only survivor of my family. I don't know what my mother, my father, my brothers looked like. But because of Yad Vashem, I found my birth certificate, my brother's birth certificates, and my battery just went down. So I don't know if you can hear me anymore because we have no electricity. We have our first snow in Jerusalem. It's beautiful, but very cold, but not as cold as it was in Bergen-Belsen. And at least here we have warm clothes and we have food. Thank God for that. Um, but uh, as I was saying, I, I found a lot of information. I found that I was sick in Sweden with typhus, with diphtheria, with dysentery, and the Swedish hospitals brought me back to health. And I am grateful for that. And um, uh, Yad Vashem is very helpful in conducting any kinds of research in the past or learning about the future or today. So please all come and take advantage of what we'd like to share with you. Thank you, Ma Marina. And we confirm the, the statement of our secretary. There's a lot of reactions, uh, even in this Zoom platform and even in the live streaming at the Dep at Facebook uh, uh, page. And we will be sending you some of the comments and reactions from the, our Facebook participants and our Zoom participants, Ma Marina, uh, affirming your uh, uh, their, their appreciation of what you have shared a while ago. Thank you. Yes, you said Tony. Actually, at the at the uh, our Zoom platform, we have uh, uh, now more than four hundred uh, participants left, and then we still have more than four thousand participants in the Facebook Live, and uh, and we are uh, gathering a lot of questions. Earlier, I think what Molly, also clarify. Yes. Earlier, Oli, we have one, one uh, oh, about a thousand in the Zoom. So, yes, wow. actually, we have more than uh, a thousand, and some are waiting. Actually, and and this is the first time that we staged this Holocaust in the Department of Education, and we invited all our teachers, uh, spe specifically our Arling Panlipunan and Education sa Pagpapahalaga teachers, and we also have our supervisors and even our superintendents. 
uh, nationwide are also uh, join, joined, have also joined us uh, earlier in our commemoration. Uh, Yusik Tony, you still have questions before I accommodate questions from oh, our you, live you, participants? You go ahead, accommodate the questions now, please, Rolly. Yes, thank you, Yusik Tony. We have with us the, uh, a learner, so I, I think I, I need to uh, uh, call first the learner coming from the uh, Schools Division of Crescent City. Uh, we have the president of the uh, Supreme Student Government, uh, Mr. Humphrey Soriano. Humphrey, good afternoon. And we give a uh, spotlight to Humphrey. You cannot unmute now. You cannot unmute. unmute. Can, can yes. we ask somebody to unmute you? Please. Can we unmute Keep. him, please? Yeah, thank you. So Humphrey is one of our learners. Uh, my, 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 uh, my, I have no electricity because of the snow and my battery is only five things. So if anybody has any questions, uh, please get them for me and I will try to call back or call them. But I, I'm, I'm running out of things. Thank you. Can Noted you on that, Marina. Later, okay, and I, I called. Thank you very much. Humphrey, are you ready? Can we give spotlight to Humphrey? Hello, Paul. Yes, go ahead, Humphrey. Uh, greetings of peace to everyone. Uh, uh, first, I would like to ask for, uh, uh, there were so many countries Paul, that are unwilling to accept uh, Jews who wish to leave Germany. I, why, why, why did this happen, Paul? Thank you, Humphrey. Um, Dr. Deutsch. Why did it happen? Yes. And the, the question is, who are your tar what's your target? Who are you targeting the question to? To me, I can answer as a sociologist. To a historian, he'll give you a different answer. A theologian yes. will answer a different answer. So each person you target that question with will answer a different answer. And there's a good reason for that because this event shook humanity. It shook humanity and it shook every field. For example, if you're a theologian, if you believe in God and you want to explain how God works in this world, you can't not discuss the Holocaust. It has to be part of your consideration. If you write literature like Adorno said, and you like writing a literature and you want to talk about how the human race is so wonderful or you can't write the same way after the Holocaust because you have to include that some people do what they've done there into your thoughts when you think about people. So I think the question of why it happened is, is, is something that I, I doubt humbly if I can answer that way. I, I don't know, you know, th this question, my daughter also asked me once and my answer to her was, first of all, I don't fully understand. After I don't understand, I can explain a few aspects. But I think if I have to choose something that um, Elie Wiesel said and also that is relevant to your students, there will always be extreme people and there will always be radicalization. The question will, is, will there be enough people to stop it? I think what, why is a question I can't answer? What enabled it is a question I can answer. What enabled it is people that were silent, nations that were silent, people that looked the other way. And I think that's what's relevant to us because you know, crazy races, sorry for saying this, will always be there, will always be around, but they will, they'll be small, small groups, not large groups. The question is, how did we accept them? How did they grow so large? How did they become part of government? That, is because people enabled them. That is because the political party enabled them. So to answer your question why, I want to turn it to an educational question of how. And the other question of how is because of fractions of society, companies that benefited from financially and sold them the, the gas chambers. And so, so I think that is what is um, relevant for, for uh, uh, I think, your learners. And... Um, to be honest, I don't have a full question on why. I, 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 I think so many scholars had broken their, you know, 
pens and, and I try to answer that. So go and investigate. Uh, Dr. Thank David. you, Dr. Dr. David, thank you very much. Yes, Proof, you have additional uh -huh. to that. Rolly, just, just a short, uh, yes. shall we say, uh, rejoinder to uh, uh, Dr. Deutsch. Dr. Deutsch uh, talked about extremism. I think extremism is uh, something that uh, we should avoid as a people, as a country, as, as Filipinos. But extremism begins with oneself. When you, are, when you don't want to listen to the opinion of others, if you only see black and white, if you only see that a person is just either good or bad, you do not see the good points, the bad points, so that you can learn from it. And if, if you uh, defend um, things, even if they're wrong, I think that that kind of extremism is something that we should avoid as a people because that, the ex, that extremism in, in anything, um, in in politics, in in the way that we deal with others, this is this is what this is the lesson of the Holocaust. Is when we go to the extreme of anything. Uh, I'm not saying that we should not have a stand, but we should always have a stand. We should always know what is right and fight for what is right, but we should also understand the other. You should understand the human condition. You should understand why people believe the other way. And with this, we can foster more conversations rather than just shouting at each other, rather than just bullying each other in Facebook. When, when, we, when we call each other names that are unnecessary, this is how the Holocaust started when, they, when the Jews were being called as rats. It's something that we as a, we as a people can stop one person at a time. This kind of hatred, extreme hatred with each other, and uh, that's why I'm so happy that we are able to talk about this and and remind each other uh, that uh, sabi nga ng mga matatanda sa atin hindi ba kahit anong sobra ay masama, di ba? Ganun lang nagi. Always be moderate. Thank you, Professor Chow. I'm sure you see Tony, our teachers, our supervisors, our learners who are uh, with us this afternoon. Rolly, I also noticed among the reactions that there are those who are not with DepEd who, who are in media. So uh, this topic also is a, a great and them. Yes. Uh, yes, I was looking Secretary. at the names of those who reacted. So um, it's it's wonderful to to have more than just the more than the deaf ed people listening in, our teachers and so on. And so this uh, topic has elicited uh, much uh, interest, and hopefully we, we bring it down to the level of our learners and our teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Actually, we are we have invited our PTA officials because we believe in the uh, role of our parents in the in the learnings of our learners. That's why uh, we also uh, invited them to join us this afternoon. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, with the permission of our Mam Liling, uh, Mam Liling, I think Doc Deutsch Rolly is about to leave. Can we? get uh, his final thoughts and uh, message, please. Doc Deutsch. Okay. Yes. Um, you know, I, I've, many times I, I'm asked, what is, is the message of the Holocaust? Openly, what is, what is the message I want my students to go with? It's a very good question. Usually, I think that would be arrogant if I would come with my message I believe in and impose that to the students. What I teach my teachers and my students to do is not to say their own message, to go read a testimony of a survivor and to find his or her message and come tell me what their message is. So I'll tell you a few messages of survivors and with this I'll end. One of them is Harav Bari, uh, Berlin, Harav Barilan, and he came out with this um, 
a Talmudic encyclopedia, which is a huge religious book. It, I, it's like an encyclopedia of the Talmud. It's an incredible uh, uh, project. And he came a few years, like a few years after the Holocaust. They wanted to publish it. And he said, how can I publish this book after a third of my people died? And he was told, you have to do now three times more. And the idea is that that's his message. My grandfather, uh, may he rest in peace, had a different message. I asked him what's his message. He said one thing, family. He did not care about any other ideology. He cared only about family and the closeness of it and taking care of your family and establishing your family. That was his ideology. Some other people came to Israel and Zionism was their ideology. Some others of my family went to the US and established communities after their communities were destructed. But notice the common denominator, life. So I think that's what I want to end with, with voices that over the years I've heard survivors say, and voices of life, despite the death they went through. And I think for me, there's no, every time I say this and I pass this on to students and teachers, I also, I'm inspired by this idea that these survivors, Rina that's with us, I'm always, it, 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 it's mind blowing how much people went through and how much they had made a decision to choose life, each one in a different path and each one with different thoughts. And it doesn't contradict. It brings us a multifaceted, a diverse and wonderful array of post-war Jewish life, despite all, the, despite all the troubles and all the horrific things they went through. I think this is also inspiring, also in tune with their message and teaches your learners something so important, listening. God created us with two ears and one mouth. That's what I always tell my students. It means listen twice to what you, before you say something, listen more, especially with survivors. You want to look more. for a message? Go to the testimonies of the survivors and make your students find the message there and present it in front of the class. And I think the message of that is that they learn how to listen to survivors. They learn how to channel messages. This is what I also would like to leave you with, with the same thing I do with my students. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. I, I want to thank the, 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 uh, um, Her Excellency here joining us and, and Your Excellency Elon Flus. And I want to, I, I could continue, and Professor Chow and Roli and, and of course Rina and whoever facilitated this. I, I probably didn't say thank you to everyone and I am sorry for that, but I, I am very, very grateful for this opportunity. I am very keen to continue this cooperation forward. I have lesson plans and everything you need. And this is a, un, a new precedent that I hope will continue forward. I am continuing on the 27th of January. I've been in Malaysia this morning. I'm continuing on to India and I have a long, long day ahead of me. So thank you all and all the very best from snowy Jerusalem. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening and day. Thank you very much, Dr. David Deutsch. We really appreciate your time and your uh, thoughts about this uh, celebration that we are conducting. And we're very lucky to have you uh, as our resource person and panelists on this uh, uh, wonderful symposium that we are doing in the Department of Education. Thank you very much. Yeah, you see, Tony, as I am uh, saying a while ago, I, I, I know our teachers, our supervisors, and even our learners are now uh, uh, having a lot of thoughts and questions about uh, how we're going to uh, uh, make this uh, celebration meaningful to the Filipino, especially that Philippines play a very important role in this uh, uh, event. Thank you very much uh, again, Dr. Deutsch for joining us. And uh, to continue, uh, we still have questions from our participants, this time from uh, uh, the group of our teachers. May I call in first uh, the master teacher of Manuel Rojas High School, Mama Bell Kabuboy. Mama Bell, good afternoon. Good afternoon, po. thank you, po, Sir Rolly Soriano. Good yes, afternoon, please, po, to our resources speakers, deputy officials, dignitaries, guests, parents, learners, and colleagues are watching right now. Uh, millions of Jews died and were victims of the Holocaust as a result of torture, 
medical experiments, discrimination, and demonization by the Nazis. Those who survived sought help and refuge from other countries, including the Philippines. My question is, what laws were issued by former President Manuel L. Quezon that welcomed the refugees and given government assistance? And how did these laws help other potential immigrants who benefited from this humanitarian gesture in the Philippines? Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Teacher Mabel. I think uh, Professor Chow, please uh, answer the question. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, Attorney Esquire, uh, Tonisito Mali might have a better answer, but I will answer the question. Thank you, ma'am, for your question. Uh, a historian, a fellow young historian, Ian Christopher Alfonso of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, actually reminded me that in the speech that Manuel Luis Quezon uh, delivered in the Marikina Hall, he touched on what he said, there's the, uh, the National Assembly approving an immigration law in the 1940s, 1940. The year was 1940. And that immigration law gave the president unlimited powers to welcome refugees. Now, remember that we were still at that time under the United States. But this is where Manuel Quezon and the National Assembly exemplified uh, uh, some sort of independence from America by saying that our president can now have the power to accept as many immigrants as possible. And that is why eventually that madam uh, had its effect in the many, many times, not just the during the white Russians, which I, I, I already stated earlier, or the, the boat people from Indochina, Vietnam, but in many, many others. And I hope that you visit the UNH, uh, UN uh, Refugee uh, Center. They, they, they have a website, uh, UNHCR, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, you can see there the various uh, narratives of the things where we accepted uh, refugees from other countries. And yeah, so, so I, I guess that that answers uh, uh, on my part the question. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. That's why I cannot uh, give you the, the specific um, provision or the, the specific law. But anyway, I would like to first recognize uh, Katai Musensho who is here from CNBC. I would like to, my, my auntie is listening, uh, Edna Briones de Guzman, my mother, Vil Machua, Noel Orozco of Bea in the Dep Ed, uh, central office, and uh, also my teacher, Rizal Valenzuela, uh, my elementary teacher, a Dep Ed teacher now, who is also watching us, with us uh, today. And to all of you, I'm sorry I cannot greet all of you, but thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much for that uh, answer. You said, Tony, you have additional answer to that question? Uh, hindi ko maibigay yung uh, exacto with the permission of our Ma'am Liling po uh, na mga batas na naipasa. But maybe I just would like to share that uh, at that time, again, uh, as we all know, uh, we have a commonwealth uh, form of uh, commonwealth uh, form of government, if you may. And under that concept, there was the tidings Macduffy law, which provide for the establishment of a Philippine Commonwealth government, which will be a prelude to the grant of uh, in, in, uh, eventual independence to the Philippines. The, the, the Commonwealth of the Philippines at that time has uh, what you call a, uh, as we all know, the, the, the same thing, presidential system of government, though a unicameral assembly po, ma'am. So yung uh, National Assembly noon has the power to legislate laws, but uh, while uh, that is the situation, uh, uh, there is still a requirement kasi hindi po po tayong lubusang malaya sa bansang Amerika. Uh, mayroon po, halimbawa, basta yung saligang batas ng uh, Commonwealth, kailangan pong i-certify po ito ng Pangulo ng uh, Estados Unidos. It has to be certified by the United States. The United States also retains some powers notwithstanding that we have a a commonwealth government with a president, vice president, and a, a legislature to certify some uh, laws, powers relating to imports, exports, and even Professor Chow immigration laws. And uh, that, that may still require the approval of the president of the United States of America. My understanding is everything that happened 
at that time, hindi po ba Professor Chow Chua yes. has the blessings of uh, of the United States of America. Yes. Of course, it won't uh, happen if it will not start with uh, President Manuel Luis Quezon uh, to begin with. So th th that's the arrangement. But as to the specific laws, uh, I would like to say, uh, you know, ve very, very basic uh, laws that should be considered. If you, from another country, you go to another country, uh, there are immigration laws, uh, visa laws, there should be a reason why you are entering and therefore uh, as a uh, political, uh, uh, whether by way of asylum or refugee. So you talk about immigration laws, among others. So those should be some of the, and, and I would like to appreciate what uh, Professor Chua uh, mentioned. So those should be the aspect of the Philippine legal system that should have been uh, considered at, at that time. Uh, uh, very briefly, uh, Jose Kubali, uh, tama kayo. And uh, because at that time, foreign policy, foreign affairs was actually not given to us. We don't have power over foreign yeah. policy. Isa yan sa mga, kasi they gave us a lot of powers in other respects, but I think foreign policy is one where we were yeah. not given as much. I think, yeah. So, salamat po. I think the yeah. ambassador is really, uh, the you. good yes. ambassador. Yes. Uh, yes, Ambassador Floss. I may join the, if I may join the conversation. Uh, yes, Secretary. All of, us, all of us are familiar with how governments work, especially uh, Philippine uh, governments and Philippine governance. Many decisions which end up as laws start off as conversations, start off as consultations. Like, Anina, sinabi ni David na na uh, McNutt, the commissioner, the high commissioner, and, and President Quezon were, were cordial with each other. So I suppose they had many discussions which led to whatever legitimized decisions uh, uh, surfaced. No? So um, uh, what I'm just trying to point out is that kasi nagtatanong kayo what laws, but how did that, such laws uh, uh, appear? How did they, how were these laws uh, agreed upon? Uh, you cannot just, uh, in, in my own uh, perception, uh, not every Tom, Dick, and Harry can just uh, present a bill and expect Congress to pass it or, or expect the High Commissioner or expect the high and mighty government of the United States to approve it. So there are a lot of backroom uh, talks and uh, negotiations and exchanges of opinions, which led to whatever... Uh, legitimate uh, decisions were made between the United States and, and, and the Philippines. Yun lang importante kasi ang reality is laws are not passed automatically. Uh, decisions, uh, formal decisions are not made automatically. There is always the informal aspect of government. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not also good. Diba? The results may, may be uh, also uh, 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 unhappy, pero uh, that's how it goes. Like, um, let me give you a, a, an example uh, sa nagtatanong, not, not to Quezon. Fast forward tayo sa modern, uh, sa Philippines, contemporary public finance, halimbawa, the passing of the budget. Yung uh, pass, final passing ng budget, the body, House has its version, Senate has its version, and they're supposed to integrate the different versions and harmonize the different versions. But always, the executive takes part, but not formally. Executive knows exactly what is going on between the two houses. And nothing uh, is uh, in the final form, for example, of the budget, is, is uh, at all, uh, has to be agreed upon. And itong bicameral committee, for example, uh, this is an exam example of a, a formal body, bicameral, both houses supposedly harmonize their versions of the budget, but always the executive is there. Kaya ang tawag niya, ng bicameral committee is the third house 
You have two houses of Congress approving the budget, but actually there is a third house, which is composed of, of uh, representatives, the Senate and the executive, but nothing is on record. Walang minutes yan. And, and, and th th this, is a, uh, uh, this is part of, of the governance uh, system. So, uh, kung mayroon mang mga, ano, mga uh, laws or, or pronouncements which uh, 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 President Quezon succeeded in passing, it was because he most likely negotiated, most likely he bargained, and hopefully, uh, I suppose, he even threatened considering his personality uh, uh, as well, no? So ito, mga, that's where the political scientists come in because it's all about negotiations. Oo, tawag nga namin yan sa public ad, the third house, hindi yung two houses. There, there are three houses actually who have to agree on many things. Thank you. Thank Sorry you very for, much, Secretary. Yes, Ambassador Floss. Thank you. I will, be, I will be very brief. And I, I was what the secretary said that there was a whole process which led to uh, end of the day negotiations between uh, the president, McNutt, the um, um, Department of State uh, at the US and so on. But there was another uh, a, a player here, which was a Jewish community here in the Philippines, yes. uh, led by uh, the Finland uh, brothers. Uh, because one of the actually conditions in order to allow those refugees to enter the country was also to make sure that they can uh, economically can be independent and not to be a burden on the, on the, on the country, on the state. Uh, so the Jewish community was able to facilitate here. So, uh, and they were also putting a lot of pressure. Obviously, originally the plan was for 10,000 Jews to be able to enter the country. But at the end of the day, uh, only 1,300 were able to, uh, to make it, which is still a, a very a significant uh, number. So just as a small uh, input. And the, my apologies, I have to leave in a few minutes. Or uh, have to, uh, you're absolutely so, right. They played a very important role. It's a yeah. tripartite thing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Secretary Briones and Ambassador Floss for that uh, uh, additional information about the question. Um, we still have questions from our participant. Uh, this time, I would like to call in Mac Kenneth Baluyot, teacher two of Cruz Naligas National High School. Sir Kenneth. Hello, um, good afternoon. I good evening, Sir Rolly and the rest of the panelists. Um, my question is, with the learnings from the Holocaust experience as shared by our speakers, how will it shape our global perspective of human rights? Yeah, thank you, Sir Kenneth. Um, Raleigh, Raleigh, with the permission yes. of the Secretary, if we could ask uh, His Excellency, Ambassador Ilan Flos, to give his thoughts on that question and your final thoughts and message, please, before you said uh, you, you need to leave, please, uh, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. I will respond. At the end of the day, the UN and the Human Rights Council uh, and in general human rights uh, came out of uh, or as a result of the Holocaust. Um, and uh, so this is, I would say, in a way, a legacy which continues. So it's not only a legacy because we live uh, in uh, and the issue of human rights is an evolving issue um, as modern times are we're facing new challenges. Um, and of different aspects, not only not only um, uh, genocides, but also issues of uh, rights of people with disabilities, of women, and so on and so forth. So uh, this agenda of human rights is it's a living agenda, which uh, I think as a, as the an international community, uh, it uh, really took place after the after the Holocaust with quite a few Jews really involved deeply in the process and it is continuing until today and it is very extremely important that it will uh, continue um my and this is connected to my actually maybe sort of closing remarks uh, we have the history which we have to uh, remember um 
obviously the Jewish people do remember, but it is important that the international community is there in remembrance, remembers, and this is why we have this day today, because we still see uh, from one side as the Jews, we still see and face anti-Semitism until today. And these days it is raising uh, and we are, it is monitored and we see raising anti-Semitism in the United States, in Europe, uh, which is something which is very worrying. And it's not only posts in uh, social media, but it is all the way to physical attacks and, uh, um, and so on. But uh, so it is the anti-Semitism, but it is also other ways of hatred and uh, um, and uh, uh, I mean we, we have seen uh, what uh, the genocide uh, in in uh, in other circumstances. Uh, so uh, and I think it was also said before that we have to be aware. We have to uh, make sure that we uh, um, raise our voice and our action when we see uh, human rights violations, uh, and especially when it goes to uh, to the um, e e extremism, um, um, including taking people's life. Uh, this is our responsibility of, as human beings and as citizens of this uh, world. Um, and my last remarks is again, really thank you very much uh, um, to DEPED and to uh, Secretary Leonor for um, uh, being partners uh, to this event, and uh, I, it is in, important for us, uh, uh, Yusuf to continue our discussions on the future programs. Uh, you, there's a lot of uh, interest uh, from our side as the embassy, but also uh, Rina as a survivor. There are also others, uh, and also with Yad Vashem uh, to, de to develop a continuous program which will. Uh, um, not only work with educators, but at the end of the day, we have to reach out to the also to the wider public together with you. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, His Excellency Ambassador Ilan Flus. Uh, with the permission of our dear Secretary Ma'am, I think this is the beginning of our close collaboration with the Embassy of Israel for so many things that we need to do uh, in uh, partnership with uh, our uh, partners from the embassy and the Department of Education up to the uh, uh, participation of our teachers and the uh, supervisors to create a more uh, um, uh, uh, formal uh, uh, injection of uh, the idea, the learnings of the Holocaust in our curriculum. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Yes, Tony. No, I, I just want, want to uh, ask our Madam Secretary uh, if uh, she could uh, share her thoughts on the same question about human rights and the comments of our uh, Ambassador Ilan. Uh, if our Madam Secretary, please. Thank you very much. I, I completely agree with the views of the uh, of the Ambassador and. Uh, we can get lessons from the experience uh, as we face uh, uh, the various challenges, not only in education, but uh, uh, many other aspects of our development as a, as a country. And uh, I don't think, and I'm sure Ambassador agrees with me that um, our, um, our partnerships, our joint activities, uh, can be limited only to the Holocaust because uh, Israel has so much to share uh, with the world in terms of advances, for example, in, in, in technology. Uh, they're very, very uh, much ahead of uh, many uh, other uh, countries. Uh, their uh, survival in, in, in a hostile uh, environment, which has called forth all their creative uh, uh, energies. And there, uh, there are many uh, uh, lessons, many uh, experiences we can share uh, with Israel and which will easily resonate with, with the Filipinos because Filipinos are uh, familiar with, with the many aspects of, 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 of Israel, maybe not the Holocaust, 
but there are many other uh, aspects that they are familiar with because, you know, after all, uh, as Christians, uh, we, we are exposed to the, the history of the Jewish uh, people. Uh, we are exposed to the Bible. Uh, in my own personal experience, when I went to Israel, everything was so familiar to me. Uh, the names, the personalities, and uh, the, the stories, for example, David and Goliath, that is biblical, uh, about Hero the King, about the life of Jesus. That, that's all connected also to the very place where he, he was born and where he died. So, um, and before ascension, so uh, um, we do not necessarily have to limit ourselves to the Holocaust. When I went to Israel, it was it, I was at the time secretary of the Commission on Audit, and I was very impressed with the way I'm Augustohan Motoni because their system of audit is that it's that of a court of audit. It's headed by a chairman who, who uh, has the powers of a justice. Talagang court sila mag oh. decide oh, and, and, uh, and Appointed uh, by the president then ma'am or prime minister. Appointed. Yes, yes, yes. Court of audit. And uh, uh, magugustuhan mo dahil many of them are trained in law. <laughs> But multidisciplinary, they have policy science people, they have economists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Pero mayroon silang one, one as I said, uh, chair of the court of. That's why it's even called the court of audit. And so I, I found that uh, a very interesting yung multidisciplinary approach and so on. So marami tayong ma tuto sa kanila the, the way they teach also. Uh, there are advances in science and technology, uh, perhaps for the level of our learners. Uh, there are many uh, aspects which can be explored and which can be a benefit to our uh, teachers particularly. We were already thinking along those lines uh, of, of teachers uh, 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 coming over and visiting and learning. Uh, I, I'm not for one-day conferences or three-day conferences. Uh, I'm really for, uh, for very serious study by, by our teachers. So, ito, hindi lang Holocaust. Maybe Holocaust is the trigger, but there will be other uh, areas of cooperation, uh, Tony. Uh oh I, maybe you'll be interested, as I said, in their for, their system of the court of audit. Because court yung ano opo, nila eh. Opo ma'am, opo ma'am. Oh, oh, very, ano, very impressive, as I said. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, Secretary and Yusik Tony. We still have questions from our live participants. And this time, I would like to call in Dr. Leo Angeles, Public Schools District Supervisor of SDO Quezon City. Doc Leo? Okay, good, uh, good evening po sa ating mga dear panelists. Okay, since isa po sa mga dahilan ng ating talakayan sa gabing ito ay ang ating mga estudyante. Ang aking pong tanong is, what could be the best lesson children can learn from the Holocaust? Thank you very much, Doc Leo. I think Rolly, we start with, uh, yes, you say, Tony. Siguro si Ma'am uli, tapos si Doc Chow, si Ma'am uli. Ma'am, what's uh, the best Pinita, lesson that we can Arlene. learn, Ma'am? We learned it, Leo, uh, from perhaps Nelson Mandela. Sabi niya na if children can be taught to hate. Kasi, can you imagine an entire country is superior uh, in intelligence and, uh, uh, you, you know, very high, highly educated generally to be swayed by the, the thoughts and the ideas of one person into a orgy of madness. So, ang hirap mong... That's something that is very difficult for us to grasp. Ako, hi, 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 hirap na hirap ako dyan. And uh, so, uh, anong dapat, anong lesson? Uh, sabi nga ni Nelson, if we teach children, we can teach children how to hate. 
the Jews are bad, other races are, are inferior, tayo ang superior. You can also teach them to love. And that is the easier part. Loving is easier than hating. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Secretary. Can we hear from Professor Chow? Well, uh, sususugan ko na lang yung sinabi ni Secretary ano, na sa totoo lang, um, ang lesson sa Holocaust, kahit anong sobra, hindi talaga maganda. Di ba? Uh, yung nas- ang, social- ang, ang, ano, ang Nazi means national socialism. Extreme nationalism ang pinraktis. So yung pala pagka sobra ang pagkapanatiko mo kahit sa bansa mo ay hindi rin maganda. ba? Diba? Kasi tandaan natin na yung panatisismo parang hindi na yes, diba kapag ka pag-ibig eh, diba? Hindi, hindi na pag-ibig yun eh. Pag panatiko ka hindi ka na umiibig. So, kasi kaya kailangan pag-ibig sa bayan ang ipakita mo hindi panatisismo. That's one. Uh, kaya kahit ano, so, sobra ka, sobrang paniniwala mo sa politika mo, pasama din yun. Yun talaga. And uh, yung, yung kailangan siguro nating makita dito ay yung makinig. Uh, na, dahil hindi ka sobra ang pagkapanatiko mo sa paniniwala mo, nakikinig ka sa kapwa mo, bakit ganun yung paniniwala niya? Baka may matutuhan ka rin. Kahit hindi mo tanggapin yung sinasabi niya, matutuhan mo sa siya nagbubula. No? Kasi yung, yung kapag hindi na tayo nag-uusap, yun na yun. Yun na yung kapag hindi na tayo nakikinig sa isa't isa, yun na yung pinagmumulan ng mga ganito, ng genocide, ng civil war, di ba? Ay antayin ba natin na tayo-tayo mismo ang magpatayan? Di ba? Yan ang, yan ang kailangan nating makita dito. Yun yung pinakaleksyon. At yung, yung pag-ibig sa kapwa, pag-ibig sa bayan, pag-ibig sa Diyos, tinuro niya Andres Bonifacio yan. Diba? Sa, katil- eh, sa dekalogo ng katipunan, sumapala tayo sa may kapal ng tentim sa puso, gunam-gunamin sa sarili tuwinan ang tunay na pagsapala tayo sa kanya ay ang pag-ibig sa bayang tinubuan sapagkat ito ang tunay na pag-ibig sa kapwa. Ganun lamang. At eh, pagka umiibig ka, hindi sobra yan. Tamang, l- laging tama lang yan. Dahil kapag sobra ka rin umibig, nakakasama na rin yun. Kaya lahat yun talaga ang pinaka-basic lesson. Lahat ng sobra hindi maganda. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chow. I think for the last question from our uh, live participant, may I call in uh, Ma'am Idorlina uh, Balenya, the program, uh, the education program supervisor in Araling Palipunan in the division of uh, Quezon City. Ma'am Balenya, I'm mute now, Rolly. Did I show my unmute? Pambalinya. To our. Yes. Good evening. Yeah, thank. Yeah. Hindi ako makapag-unmute kanina. Okay. It's okay. So, good evening to all po. Okay. So, um, although during the the initial preliminary meeting, no, we from SDOQC already committed ourselves, no, to develop modules regarding this, um. Uh, uh, event no in our history but my question is um aside from the yad vashem remembrance center website no presented earlier and uh, what other documentaries and film no can you suggest to teachers to use as reference materials in their classroom both for the elementary and high school learners ako muna tony kasi i have a very quick answer uh, I wonder how many of you saw the film about Manuel Quezon. Uh, how he, yung starring si Bagat Singh. Quezon's Game. Uh, um, ako, uh, di ko pa napapanood ma'am. Papanoorin ko pagkatapos ito. Uh, papaluin kita. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry ma'am. Papaluin <laughs> kita. Uh, Sorry ma'am. Any, anyway, uh, aside from uh, the role of the teacher, the, the teacher really guides Kasama's adventure of learning, uh, and, 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 and so on. Uh, there are other very effective material. And, and ako, I'm, I'm a firm believer in film. Kasi, kasi yung film in one or two hours talagang, kung tago sa puso yan, eh, 
ano, naiiyak ka, naiinis ka, sumisigaw ka, and feel has that capacity to move you. So, nagtatanong ka anong material, additional material. Y- yung, yung film na yon kasi madali kang maka, ano, maka, maka uh, identify dahil Pilipino naman ang artista, Pilipino ang setting, and uh, lalo na kung may teacher ang teacher ang nag-guide no? sa mga estudyante on the adventures. Mar- maraming ano, uh, I don't know kung mayroong mga written material na hindi sobrang bigat kasi karamihan kasi nitong mga material na ito pang, pang tertiary level, uh, prefer to uh, yes. mga pang college ba. Ang eh, iniisip natin yung mga high school level ano uh, mga bata so uh, film is and uh, dance is very very powerful oh wow. kung uh, that, that would really make for wonderful theater the way lapu-lapu is great theater uh, no limit tanghere is great theater saka gets ka agad yung uh, halimbawa yung opera na ano no limit tanghere and daming umiyak sa istorya ni Sisa at yung kanyang mga anak. Perhaps more than those who cried na binabasa lang nila yung libro. Pero makita mo yung ano, marinig mo yung pag-aawit ni Sisa at sa kanyang mother and child na saguta nila. Mangyak-ngyak ka talaga. So, so ganun ka-powerful ang film. I believe in film. I believe in dance. I believe in uh, other approaches To, to, to learning other than than reading and of course uh ito uh, professor Cho, you will like this because but i keep on repeating it no uh, yung uh yung sabi ni Stephen Hawking wherever you have a brilliant teacher a, a student you can be sure there is a brilliant teacher somewhere Wow. produkto yan ng ano kaya napakahalaga ng papel ng 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 teacher kasi parang learning is such an adventure ba masaya ang dami mong matutunan matatawa ka maiiyak ka eh kasama mo si teacher and so uh, yun ang masabi ko thank that you is, very that much film is readily available i believe like yeah. for example eh yeah. ano din natin yung ano yung uh, Kulyon. Yeah. Uh, it's a very moving film. Eh, maraming aspeto sa ating kasaysayan na away tayo ng away, ganyan-ganyan, kasalanan mo yan, krimen mo yan. Pero maraming aspeto na hindi naman alam, hindi natin tinuturo. Like like uh, what happened also, the humanity of, of, of Kulyon. Yeah. I, I, I hardly cry. But yeah. when I also visited Kolyon, na iyak talaga ako when I saw when I visited the the museum because doon mo makita na you are not just dealing with numbers but you are dealing with 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 humans and teachers uh, like Professor Cho they have this capacity to ano to draw that out from the students. Kaya ano ilagay mo yan sa kwarto mo wherever there is a brilliant student. There is a brilliant teacher. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll quote that to mom. I'll, I'll say that to mom when I go around and uh, give my messages. Oh, if you may, you. if you may, Rolly, napakaganda yes, yes, sinabi ng ating uh, uh, kalihim. Uh, so, Kesson's Game and Kulyon. At napakaganda na yung konsepto o yung ideya na matututo tayo sa pamamagitan ng uh, panonood ng uh, pelikula. Tulad po nito, dahil talagang tama yun. Yung sinabi ni Ma'am, di ba, Rolly, mas madali tayong makaintindi, lalo na kung mga bata, yung yes. uh, ituturo mo ng, uh, uh, sa pamamaraan na magbabasa pa ng libro or kung ano mang mga materyales ay napaka-epektibo. So, Kessel's Game and Cool yun. Ang ganda nung sinabi ng ating Ma'am Liling. Can we ask, Rolly, Professor Cha, where our teacher Uh, ma'am, uh, if I may share, uh, yung galing sa museum na material na parang nag-virtual tour tayo, hindi ba, Rolly? Uh, may pakiusap yes, yes, na hindi natin pwedeng i-upload yon kasi bawal okay. talaga. And that's why we're very lucky po, ma'am, that uh, we were given that opportunity 
to have that virtual tour in the uh, museum uh, kanina po. Uh, but again, the, the, the embassy's request is to uh, cut that portion because uh, that's the only way to, to see all those uh, uh, materials for us to maybe visit the, that uh, museum uh, one day. So uh, having said that, if we could ask our professor Chow Chua, how could our teachers access yung slides niyo po kanina? Yung napakagandang, I mean, hindi po maganda, pero mga larawan na mayroon po kayo na pag napakita sa ating mga guru mga anak ay talagang madadama nila kung uh, bakit po ba itong holocaust na tinatawag ay hindi na dapat kahit, kahit kailan mangyari. Ayun, uh, Yusek, mayroong... Uh... Hindi available, I think hindi siya available na uploaded yung uh, buong uh, Rescue in the Philippines uh, Refuge from the Holocaust na film, the documentary that was made before Quezon's Game. And by the way, I would like to uh, recognize uh, Mashab Philippines said here, the producer of movie Quezon's Game is here with us and uh, si Ma'am Lorena Rosen yon. Si Ma'am Lorena Rosen and he, she said, I am here po and will share Quezon's Game from Aparito Holo. So, syempre, we have to help our filmmakers. So, you can book a, a screening with her. Maybe she will uh, give you information how to book a screening. Nababayad naman tayo ng kaunting-kaunti lang para sa mga filmmakers natin para tuloy-tuloy pa silang gumawa ng ibang pelikula at masustain naman. But uh, in the, in, 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 ano, yung mga ganitong materials, pwede nyo yung mga pictures na yung iba uploaded naman. Hanapin nyo lang yung, ano, yung, uh, hanapin nyo lang yung Jews in the Philippines, Quezon, ganyan makikita nyo na yung sa Google for the pictures. But for movies, uh, na, syempre na dyan yung Schindler's List, no? aside from Quezon's Game. Uh, yung, there's a, there's a, in, in the year 2000, merong telemovie on Anne Frank. I think it's available in YouTube. Yung mga tukol kay Anne Frank. And also, in the, the, the British Broadcasting Company, BBC, they were able to create a lot of series. Kaya mahilig kayo sa Netflix, series-series. No, na ang haba-haba, no? ito six, may six part on the Auschwitz. Merong tungkol sa rise ng Nazism. Merong tungkol sa kay Adolf Hitler. Uh, yung mga Holocaust stories. No? Uh, again, when you listen from the, uh, from the uh, testimonies themselves, yun ang nakaka, nakaka, ano yun, nakaka ingganyo, pagganyak, sabi nyo nga, motivation sa pag-aaral. And also, uh, I, I created for, if you want, kasi minsan, Yusek, ang problema sa classroom, lalo na sa online class, maikli lang ang oras. Meron ako three minutes na ginawa on Anne Frank. I, I, YouTube nyo po yan, Shao Time, X-I-A-O Time, Anne Frank. No? Uh, yan po yung uh, ating, uh, ano, no? yan po yung pwede nyo ma, uh, ma, sandali lang, may tumatawag kasi. Pero, uh, yan yung ating pwedeng ma-access. Ma no? And also, aside from that, meron din tayong mga comics. Alam nyo may nilabas po na comics ang, ang Israel Embassy to the Philippines, yung Open Doors, Open Hearts. And I think yung video na nakita nyo rin, baka pwede nyo rin makita yan dun sa YouTube, pati yung speech ni Manolo Quezon. Manuel Quezon III, uh, uh, i-YouTube nyo yung kanyang pangalan tsaka yung sabihin mo na yung uh, Jews in the Philippines siguro, makikita mo na yung mensahe niya. Pwede nyo pong ipalabas yan, yung mga material na yan sa inyong mga klase. Mahirap kasing hanapin yung kay Frank Ephraim. Ano? Napakahirap hanapin itong librong ito, Escape to Manila from Nazi Tyranny to Japanese Terror. Si yung kanina, nabanggit ko rin yung isang aklat na si... Uh, Ronnie Harris, Philippine Sanctuary, a Holocaust Odyssey. May sinulat din siya na clarification sa Holocaust history, ay yung history ng mga Jews sa Pilipinas. Hanapin nyo, Ronnie Harris, Jews in the Philippines. Pwede nyo hong, uh, makita yung kanyang mga uh, sinulat. But uh, that said, um, last one, Sir Tony, alam ko, gaul na tayo sa oras, uh, pero gusto ko lang i-recognize yung kaibigan ko, si Mika Merenyo. And a question also, DepEd teacher yan, uh, and a, a question also from my historian friend, John Ray Ramos. Nagtanong si John Ray, meron bang memorial for the Holocaust here in the Philippines? Now, akala, nung una, akala ko wala. Pero apparently, in 2018, the before one week before uh, former Israeli Ambassador Effie Ben Matityao left 
the country, he opened with the Quezon City government. That's why we ha- we are here with the Quezon City government. Sila talaga yung nag-start yan through Mayor of Joy Belmonte. She started a memorial at the Quezon Memorial Circle. Yung tinata- yung ano, yung isang memorial doon for Quezon and the uh, Jews na nakarating dito sa Pilipinas. So doon na rin ginagawa yung ilan sa mga paggunita sa Holocaust. So you can visit that in the Quezon City uh, Memorial Circle. So yun po, marami pong salamat uh, sa uh, pagkakataong sumagot. Thank you very much. Ayan, ang dami na pong mga materials sa na nabanggit po yung ating uh, uh, mga resource person po. No? Numpisan po ng ating mahal na secretary, uh, Ma'am Liling, and then uh, Yusik Tony and Professor Chow. And at the same time, no, um, very practical ang, uh, ang sagot na at the same time, we are promoting our arts and culture na napaka-importante po na magbuhay po sa atin. dito po sa Pilipinas. Yes. Ang dami po nating natutunan. Rolly, may nag, uh, nag-message kanina na yung The Boy in the Stripe Pajamas. Uh, that is a very moving film. Sila, mag, pag may pelikula about children, ano ka agad yan? Puso mo talaga ang uh, umaandar. And I, I saw that film myself. na dalawang bata, yung isa na sa labas, yung isa na sa loob. Secretary, ang ganda. Oo. Oo. At saka Oo. secretary, ang ganda na sabay-sabay kayong nanonood. At the same time, uh, na, natutunan ninyo oh. ang mga leksyon na ina, uh, ini-impose po dun sa ating It's a mga... powerful film also. Oo. Thank you very much, secretary. So, ang dami po nating natutunan, ano? Uh, Nagkumpisa tayo sa mga impact ng ideology, racial discrimination, and even political power, up to the respect to the human rights, the too much of everything, and the love of country. And at the same time, sa ngayon, I know we're now admiring the uh, political will of our President Manuel Quezon. We have gotten a lot of questions from the participants and viewers, but in the interest of time, we will be concluding the segment and uh, rest assured that all your questions will be addressed by our panelists. Uh, our secretary will gather all that questions and will try to address that and send back to you. And then before we end, uh, I may ask our panelists, starting with Professor Chow Chua, to say their final thoughts and your message po for our participants. Dr. Cha, uh, Prof? Well, halos nasabi ko na lahat ng dapat kong sabihin. Siguro pwede na ako magsalita sa ating wika no? at uh, may ilan na rin sa ating mga foreign guests ang umalis. Uh, gusto ko lang sabihin no? na nagpapasalamat po ako. I will take this opportunity. I think this is the... Uh, ito na yung pang labing dalawang time na in-invite ako for a national webinar for uh, the ano no for the Department of Education. Salamat Yusek Tony. Uh, salamat Ma'am Liling. Uh, Siyempre, salamat din kay Romy Paraino. Uh, sa inyong lahat, thank you so much for trusting me with this. At ito nga po, no, uh, ang nakakatuwa po kasi dito sa ginagawa natin ngayon ay... pinapahalagahan. Salamat po kasi meron tayong public program ngayon na pinapahalagahan po natin ang kasaysayan. Kasi po, 13th time na pala yung Chineco, 13th time. Thank you po. No? Na, pina, sa mga symposium na ito, Ma'am Liling, thank you kasi pinapah, pinapahalagahan. Tinatanghal natin yung kasaysayan sa Department of Education. Kasi nga po, alam naman natin na sa marami pa rin sa atin ay ang tingin sa kasaysayan sa awaling panlipunan ay minor subject. no? At sa maraming iba rin na kaguro natin sa AP, ang tingin nila sa sarili nila minor subject. Mas kaunti yung oras natin. Itong mga pag-uusap na ito, we know, na magdudulot ng mga iba pang mga rethinking. No? Kung ano ba yung papel ng history sa ating education. Sinisimula na ni Ma'am Liling. Eh. Nagpupunla na siya. Kaya kabayanihan po. itong ginagawa natin sa DepEd, pinag-uusapan natin ng kasaysayan. At uh, eventually, uh, maganda ang may dudulot nito. Dahil eventually, kapag ma- ang Pilipinas, ang mga Pilipino, ay mas natuto ng mas marami pang kasaysayan na nagbibigay ng edukasyon para magpakatao sila, ay mas makikinabang po tayong lahat. Muli maraming salamat, DepEd, sa inyong kabayanihan sa panahon ng maraming pagbabaluktot sa kasaysayan. Mabuhay po kayo. 
Maraming salamat, Professor Chow Chua. We really appreciate your time and your expertise shared with us this afternoon. Rolly, Rolly, yes, yes, Tony. Uh, we will ask. Ed, ang ating pong mam liling Briones po moving forward po mam ano pong palagay niyo mam final thoughts po mam for our dep and po mam. Kagaya ni Professor Chua, hindi na ko mag uh, ligoy ligoy at mahaba pang mga uh, salita. Uh, gusto ko lang ipagpatuloy. Gusto, gusto ko talaga yung mga magdi-discuss tayo ng mga issues uh, sa ating kasaysayan. Uh, siguro mayroong ibang na nag uh, gulat sa statement ko kasi uh, the other day ba yung International Day of Education. Kasi uh, maraming nag advice talaga sa atin na you have to catch up with technology and science. And sinabi ko na naman doon sa aking statement on the International Day of Education uh, through UNESCO, sinabi ko na naman, huwag nating kalimutan na tayo ay Pilipino, tayo ay may kultura, tayo ay may memory. Kasi uh, wala tayong kaibahan sa robot kung uh, dito lang tayo ang catch up natin ay sa ano lamang. Uh, hindi naman lamang ang catch up natin ay nakatutok sa technology at sa science. Kailangan talagang catch up din tayo sa memory natin, 'di ba, Professor Chua? Kasi with you talk about memory, pero what memory are we uh, uh, living with our children? What are we teaching them? So, maraming bagay and siguro challenge ito kay Professor Chua, mga unknown bits of uh, Philippine history pero napakalawak ng implikasyon, kagaya ng Holocaust, kagaya ng Polyon, all, all these uh, uh, stories at saka naisipan ko din yung nangyari sa Tawi-Tawi, yung, yung, yung mas na pag ano din ng, during the Philippine-American War also. Makita mo din yung horrific pictures, mga mass graves ng mga kausog. No? So, These are things that uh, we, we, we can live with our children para hindi nila makalimutan na sila ay Pilipino at hindi lang robot na mayroong brain implant somewhere in, in their physical system. So, salamat na salamat. I can see your, your faces. I can see your names. And uh, suki na suki talaga ito si Professor uh, Chua. Uh, Uh, exciting na uh, uh, lecturer and uh, sana hindi ka magsawa kung may explore kang bagong bagay which will shed light on our ano psyche or our society or our economy as as Filipinos uh, you'd always be welcome to share them with us so salamat na salamat sa ating lahat itong holocaust na ito is only the beginning thank you Thank you very much, our dear Secretary, Ma'am Liling Magtolis Priones. Thank you very much, Ma'am. And Yusek Tony, you have still uh, any uh, thoughts? We're, we're okay now. We just would like to thank, Ma'am, the Embassy of Israel, uh, the Office of the Secretary, uh, of course, our uh, External Partnership Service, the, the Special Events Unit uh, in particular, Uh, ICO po ma'am, yung ating internal, International Cooperation Office, DepEd NCR, and DepEd uh, School Division Office of Quezon City po, bukod po kay Professor Chow Chua, uh, Doc David, and all the dignitaries, uh, Ambassador Flus, at uh, lahat po, DFA Secretary, uh, Teddy Boy Loxin, at uh, lahat po ng uh, dumalo po ngayong araw na ito. Salamat po ma'am, salamat Maraming salamat, Yusek Tony. Maraming salamat po sa ating mahal na secretary, Ma'am Liling, uh, sa ating pong, uh, um, speaker, uh, Professor Chow Chua, at kanina po si Dr. Uh, David Deutsch, at saka si Ambassador Ilan Cruz. At syempre, sumama, sumama din po kanina sa atin si Ma'am Rina na nag kwento ng kanyang first-hand experience about the Holocaust. Napakaganda po ng ating uh, talakayan ngayong hapon at uh, napaka- uh, Uh, dami po ng informasyon na ating natutunan ngayong hapon. Maraming salamat po at uh, I am now turning on, turning over back to our MC, Ma'am Daisy and Sir Jalor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that fruitful and enlightening talk show. 
we would like to express our deepest gratitude to our esteemed panelists, His Excellency Ambassador Ilan Cruz, Honorable Secretary Leonor Magtolis Briones, DepEd Undersecretary Tonicito M.C. Umali Esquire, Professor Xiao Chua, Dr. David Deutsch, Ms. Rina Quinn, and Mr. Rolly V. Soriano for the rich and engaging sharing of thoughts. Sa ating pong mga kasamahan na nagbigay ng kanilang mga katanungan at sa ating mga libo-libong manonood na nagbigay ng kanilang mga komento, maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong pagmamahal sa kasaysayan.